you very much, Dr. Jamil, for a very interesting and very informative presentation. I think it's very, very interesting that the Muslim world are net importers and the non-Muslim world are exporters. And into uh, OIC trade is less than 15%. That's remarkably bad. Um, we now have a panel session which will look at the halal food uh, uh, security aspects. This will be joined by Dr. Jamil along with Ihad Al-Khatib, Head of Regulatory and Scientific Affairs at Nestle Middle East. Ihad joined Novo Nordisk to develop an overall scientific and marketing strategy for insulins, hormone replacement therapy and growth hormone and hematology. In 2009, he joined Nestle as Regulatory and Scientific Affairs for Levant, Iraq, and later for Middle East region as the Head of Corporate Regulatory and Scientific Affairs. He was a board member of the Syrian Society and a member of the Food Safety Committee and later Ihad was appointed President of the Food Safety Association in 2012. Very, very impressive. We are also uh, joined by Dr. Hassan Barakda, Scientific and Regulatory Affairs Director at Mars Company. Dr. Hassan is the Head of Scientific and Regulatory Affairs for Middle East, Africa, Turkey and India regions. He's a food regulations expert in the MENA region quality assurance management, halal, custom duty, food crisis management expert. He's a member of the Industry Food Beverage Alliance, International Life Sciences Institute, and the Emirates Standards Meteorology Authority, ESMA Food Technical Committee. Jamie Ferguson. Uh, Jamie is the regional director at the Meat and Livestock Australia. He's responsible for maintaining and increasing the Australia red meat and livestock industry's leading market positions across the GCC. Uh, the Levant, Egypt, and Maghrib countries, along with Dr. Tony Wig, Dr. Tony, who I'm introduced this morning, with over 18 years of experience of advising and working for Australian government in the GCC. No, no, please. I'll stand. <laughs> right. Okay. We have had a very interesting session today with um, a lot talked about food security. But in this particular session, what I want to do is focus more on the halal aspects. And agri-food security is a national security issue in Muslim countries. As the net importers estimated $126 billion and do not control the halal food supply chain, as Dr. Jamil mentioned. How can Muslim countries ensure they're protected against risks of food insecurity? I'd like to start with Dr. Jamil, please. Thank you. Well, I, as I mentioned uh, in my presentation just now, um, we have 57 uh, member countries in OIC, but uh, I believe that not all those countries will be in a position uh, to even be able to control, uh, to be in control the supply chain. But we do have some member countries with very strong financial resources. I guess uh, this is where I think if we, the Muslim countries that got these financial resources, you know, work uh, together uh, within this uh, uh, Hala Investment Fund, this is where we, we bring the, the fund to uh, some of the other con uh, Muslim countries that have got very strong agriculture uh, resources. By doing so, uh, you know, then you can get uh, a lot more Muslim countries uh, to be in the global supply chain, you're also in, the, in, the, in control of the supply chain, and apart from that, you're also creating the socio-economic activities in those poor countries. So that's one of uh, the ways that I see how they can get the involvement. Yeah. As an industry, it is our responsibility to provide halal food to the countries that need halal food. But I want here to highlight that the importance of the uh, clarity because we will continue to need food from out of Muslims country. And out of Muslim country, they are looking uh, to, to have new markets. When, when we talk about uh, Sharia as a reference for halal, this is a simple prescription to make people afraid or lost. 
we should have a very clear for non-Muslim what is instruction. It is similar to ISO, similar to any system that will encourage. The more we have a clarity system, the more we will have encourage suppliers to, to be involved in, in halal and to provide halal supply. Jamie, I know uh, your organization, in one way or another, has been here for 43 years. And I know you're the largest exporter of red meat to the region. But in what sense um, can we take the issue of food insecurity as far as halal meat is concerned? From Australia's perspective, we've got an obvious commitment to the region. Um, our total ex exports uh, to the Middle East, North Africa in 2013 was uh, 189,000 tonnes. So we're actually probably the third largest, uh, with India being the largest, I believe, and then uh, Brazil and Australia. Um, I think our balance is, uh, is, is probably the best, though, in that we supply lamb, mutton, goat and beef. Um, but not only to the Middle East, North Africa, also to our closest neighbour in Indonesia. Uh, we've uh, got long-standing supply chains into Malaysia, which, uh, which is a very strict um, market for access. Uh, you know, but Australia, uh, we've, only, we've only got 23 million people and we, we, our farmers who, uh, and our processors in Australia and our small population um, have a commitment to a global food market. We can't eat our production. We're not like the US. We're not like Brazil. Uh, we're not India or China. We're a, sm we're a small population in a large country. Um, so the fact we've been up here for 45 years, um, we understand the market. We have long-standing relationships, and, and we're committed to the region and its growth. Dr. Hassan, would you like to add something? You need to press the button. Thank you. Yeah, maybe I reflect also, as uh, Iyad mentioned, concerning the, the food industry, what we, we are facing globally. It's not only for our region that, as you know, we have, um, in general, some countries, uh, there is like a very, very strict uh, halal uh, regulation. And that really affect uh, uh, not only, not only the, the businesses, that it will affect also the, um, the food availability in, in the regions. And, uh, I believe that we have, uh, unfortunately, like here, for example, we don't have regulators uh, that uh, should be with us to, to uh, communicate and also to share uh, the, the concern here. And for that, we, we believe from now on, I hope that you will invite more and more the, the, the authority because they, have, they are playing a role, a very, very crucial role for this. Uh, unfortunately, we are discussing between us and uh, and this, of course, this is good that we can convey our messages to the authority, but uh, we need somebody here, uh, the decision makers, to, uh, to understand uh, the, the industry concern, even the consumer concern, etc. Tony? Uh, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and, and where it's a world food security summit that we're talking about. Uh, and uh, Australia, as we said in the session this morning, has uh, the capacity to provide food for 400 million people. Uh, we have a uh, Muslim population in Australia of, of half a million people already in our 24 million population. Uh, and we have a lot of experience, as you said, over 40 years of experience in uh, supplying uh, export food, including halal food. Uh, and our presence here and, and, and in this session is, is where uh, the customer is right. And as uh, uh, was said by Mr. Datto, uh, halal food is not just uh, the Sharia requirements, it's food safety, it's integrity. Uh, and Australia, with its uh, uh, export systems, uh, can provide that integrity. And in fact, we involve uh, our government uh, uh, Department of Agriculture is linked in with the Islamic organisations to, to provide the certification and, and we're very keen, the customer is white and uh, we're very keen to be here uh, to be able to supply the food and, and I think the main interest for halal security moving forward uh, is, is establishing uh, clear standards and clear accreditation for the certification systems and, 
and we're happy to, to work with that and also participate in developing whatever's needed. I mean, standards and certifications are very important and we'll touch on that in a few minutes' time. But I want to go back to one of the points that Dr. Jamil mentioned, which was the Halal Fund. Now, the agro food is a consumer non-cyclical asset class. It is more stable than shares or real estate that go through booms and bust cycles. And for those of us who have been in Dubai, we know both about the asset classes, both real estate and shares. They go up and they go down. However, the halal life cycle industry is a $2.3 trillion growth story with growth demographics, which has the ability to cross-sell and appeal to non-Muslims and attractive to humane treatment of livestock before religious slaughter. Therefore, is the growth of the halal food industry the answer to the Muslim world's inf insecurity issue? Data? Yes. Yes. At the moment, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, halal industry is one of those least understood industries. And as such, uh, many of the, the items within the halal industry is not uh, an asset class yet for you know, those uh, investors. But um, I would like to refer to uh, the presentation that uh, Mark Mobius, the chairman of uh, Templeton, uh, when he did his presentation last November in Dubai uh, about uh, the Islamic capital market and where uh, the areas that uh, the, the uh, private equities and the fund managers should be looking at. And he specifically mentioned that, you know, to look at the, the Sharia compliant, you know, uh, industry. This is one of the, the, the biggest opportunities because of the gaps that I mentioned just now. Yeah. So I think uh, if we can look at, you know, the, the opportunities that are available uh, within the, the Islamic uh, market, and also those are producing countries. Uh, it is about bringing the necessary money uh, to the places uh, whereby, of course, I do not uh, mean here that uh, we should be going to Muslim countries only, because at the moment, uh, even if you look at the suppliers, uh, most of the, the products are coming from the non-Muslim countries, which is fine. Yeah, halal uh, should not be just, you know, uh, be uh, <coughs> with the Muslims. Uh, so if we create this fund and if we have to go to China, because China has got a lot of uh, you know, agriculture uh, resources over there, so be it. You know, at the end of the day, if we can create you know, a more sensible asset class for the, the you know, potential investors to go to China to invest you know, and uh, create this opportunity so that we can address the halal food insecurity, as I mentioned just now, firstly, from the socio-economic from the food security, we are in control of the supply chain. From those investors, it is also a sensible economic activity because of the big gap that we see just now. I guess the, the halal food product that they produce can go to many places around the world. So I strongly believe that it makes a lot of economic sense you know, to look at the, uh, in creating the asset class within the halal industry itself. Yeah, your company controls something like 25% of the halal markets. Do you believe that there needs to be more investment in halal food to solve the halal, uh, to solve the Muslim world's insecure, food insecurity issues? Yeah, actually we respect the peace of mind of our consumers and we try to provide uh, their need from product. But this uh, creates some complexity through the supply chain, through the suppliers, it is difficult uh, to find uh, the right quality and uh, halal certified, which is accepted by the, uh, let's say, uh, the government. It's, it's a formula which is uh, actually not always works. So we have uh, always to interfere as a company to uh, make our suppliers certified or discuss with authority to accept accreditation body. So it is not always an easy formula, but uh, actually we are pushing for this. Uh, and uh, during, during this process, uh, as I said, the, the halal is not a new requirement. It is 1,400 years old. So why now we want to, to jump and let's say rush for, for halal? 
this is because of the complexity of supply chain. Now, it was production locally and produced locally. This makes things easier. Now, with the complexity of supply chain, even was produced in UAE, you are not 100%, it is halal. So you need to, to have a trust, but at the same time, you need to have some kind of control. If we try now, tried now to, to fill this gap within, let's say, one year, gap of hundreds of years, it will, it will not work. We need, we need to build step by step, work uh, on, on, let's say, decent regulation and implement in a fair way so we make sure that we have a, let's say, concealed system all over the Islamic world. But uh, now the, the way in Codex, in uh, GCC, in other countries, I think it will create confusion and they need to harmonize their efforts together. Jamie, I know a lot of the Islamic countries have bought land uh, for red meat production. Um, has that made it better for food security, do you believe, for Islamic countries? Yeah, you know, we've seen investment um, from this region and um, from Asia uh, into Australian agricultural production systems. Um, you know, that's, it's, it's an obvious step for... Um, you know, a customer, whether that's a country or an importer, to want to get further down their supply chain. Um, and, and, it's, and in some ways I think it's a good thing in that because they then understand the production systems, they're aware of them, they know the challenges. And, and for what, from what we've gathered and talking to our stakeholders in Australia, uh, the technical barriers to trade that are, that are affecting the cost of production um, is a huge issue and you talk about the developed countries are supplying more so, more so the, um, or the, you know, maybe the Western countries are supplying the, you know, the, the Western and Asian, um, you know, Muslim and Asian countries. Um, you know, in all of those developed countries there's fuel prices going up, there's labour going up and then plus there's, you have the technical barriers to trade such as um, cut off, short cut off days at entry which means that you can't air freight and you have to, uh, you can't sea freight and you have to air freight which is cost. You have additional labelling requirements, which is a cost. Um, if you talk about insecurity, I think it's around supplying, you know, a safe, affordable product uh, 12 months of the year. Um, so for, to answer your question, you know, from our perspective, it's actually good for us to see the hassads and, and so on investing into our supply chains because they understand our challenges. Dr Hassan. Your company, again, is a major producer of halal food. Um, is that the way to go? Do you believe it should... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Someone's going to be excited there. Do you believe that that's the way to do it, is to get more companies to go into halal world? Um, I, I believe that normally... Yeah, I believe that uh, the companies are producing here in... Uh, in the Muslims country, in Malaysia, Indonesia, etc., should have more, uh, the company should have more um, experience about producing halal, uh, especially when we have, for example, when we want to export from Malaysia to other uh, countries, even in, in Europe or the US, uh, the companies there, sometimes they don't have information about what halal producing, uh, how, how is uh, the halal uh, certifying as well? There is a complexity of this one. Um, we, we need also the regulation to be unified. And as an industry that we want to apply uh, as, as uh, possible uh, to have a halal uh, product to be distributed uh, everywhere, uh, and also the same for raw materials, is, uh, there is some complexity, etc. And as, as a manufacturer that we need to have um, a clear uh, regulation every, everywhere, and unfortunately we, have, we don't have such a unified regulation, and that make uh, the complexity. I, I can uh, give an example in the US, for example, it's uh, obligatory to have stunning, and in case of you want to export uh, any product to, to Muslim, uh, Muslim country where they don't allow this stunning, then it's... Uh, Another, another issue we can face, or we are facing, I believe. Uh, Tony? I mean, you work with yes. the Muslim world. Um, yeah, I, 
firstly, I think the investment in Australia is, is certainly encouraged. Uh, we're looking forward to, to growing our food industry and, and I think the sign that a lot of the countries uh, are investing in Australia is also recognition that Australia is a very reliable supplier. If, uh, if you're investing uh, in, in, a, in a supply chain, you need to know you're going to get a return on your investment. And we heard this morning part of the risks in food security at the moment are political instability and other other supply issues, water and everything else in the countries. Um, so Australia welcomes investment and I think it's a natural trend in the food industry uh, for the last 25 years. Uh, uh, consumers more and more are demanding uh, that they trust the product. Uh, and to trust the product, uh, uh, you must build the integrity into the product. You can't add it at the end in the marketing <laughs> or whatever. Uh, and I think uh, Australia has shown its uh, developed traceability systems uh, that link into, uh, for example, the halal system to, to provide that sort of integrity. And I think uh, uh, it's all part of the uh, uh, you know, giving confidence to the consumer uh, because at the end of the day, and it was identified uh, a long time ago, uh, it's one of the solutions, particularly for in some of the poor, poverty-stricken regions, is, is a uh, mistrust of, of products. If we're going to supply uh, foods that are going to solve uh, food insecurity, then, then uh, the consumers, uh, whoever they are, must uh, trust the product. Actually, you've raised two very interesting issues, and I'll take them separately. Uh, one of them is that one of the problems with the halal food industry is the mul multiplicity of certification. And this is an obstacle to its growth. Um, also, there is a lack of a single standard system. Um, this, again, is, in sh is, is limiting the number of companies that are actually entering the sector. How can this be overcome? I know that and we were actually in a panel in November when OIC was talking about creating a single system and the time framework for that was six months. Nothing's come out yet. Um, it looks like this is one of those never-ending stories. When will we actually see a single certification, a single standard, something that the whole Muslim world can, can stand behind and say, this is the one standard? And I think, I'll, I mean, I think everyone's interested in this. And I'll start off again with Dr. Jamil. Actually, the, yeah, I do agree that yes, become a major problem among the industry players, uh, the certification issue. In fact, uh, it is not sitting at OIC for the past six months. It has been there for the past 12 years. Uh, they've been trying very hard to come up with one uh, common standard for certification. Well, I do see the problem there because uh, I think the major hurdle to come up with a, a single uh, standard, halal standard for the world is the, the, the differences that they have because of the different school of thoughts you know, among the, the Muslims. So I personally don't really know whether they will ever come to a conclusion or to some kind of an agreement uh, to come up with a, a common standard. But I, I feel that my, <clears throat> my view is that at least we should look at to have one core standard. Yeah, for one halal cost standard, then we can have some supplementaries to take into account the differences you know, that uh, several countries have. But at least if you have one cost standard, then you know, it will make it much easier for the industry players to follow. Now, if you want to go to, let's say, Malaysia or Indonesia or Saudi or what, there might be some minor you know, additional things that you need to do. Okay, so be it. Because... Uh, big players like you know, Unilever, Nestle, or they, they export their product all over the world. So at least if they can hang on to one you know, what core standard, that will address you know, uh, most of the problems. So I feel that it is only an organization like OIC that can resolve this. And uh, yes, it is unfortunate that they've been sitting there for the past 12 years. Uh, but uh, I think we need to address this uh, very quickly, we don't really want to make it as a trade barrier, you know. Uh, already we are facing a very severe uh, halal food insecurity issue. Uh, we wouldn't want to see uh, the, the problem in certification become an additional barrier to the, the insecurity that we have. And I also believe that certification process should not be expensive. 
Yeah, it should not be an additional cost that the industry players would have to pay. Uh, that's one of the reasons why, I mean, in a country like Malaysia where I come from, certification is done by the government because it is not a business. You know, the government absorbs you know, uh, the certification cost as a contribution, as part of the industry development of the halal industry. Because if it becomes a business, that's where the additional, com uh, the additional cost comes in. Again, this uh, will discourage the industry players to go into halal industry if this uh, situation uh, goes on for a much longer period. Yeah, you sell to almost every country in the world. Uh, actually, we have our uh, internal uh, regulation to make sure that our product is halal. In all Muslim countries, mo uh, mo uh, Muslim dominant uh, population, our product is halal and this is our internal regulation uh, within the company. Here we want to differentiate between uh, halal food and halal certified food. So our, all our product that sold uh, uh, is halal, but not all certified halal. Because certification in, in some categories make no sense. And uh, certifying in certain cases, it's a bit complicated. So for sensitive product, it is for sure it's certified. Uh, for some categories, it is not certified because it is not required by regulation. And we hope that this will continue because uh, certifying is only adding complexity and cost which consumer uh, don't have to, to bear this additional cost uh, and complexity and less options in, in the area that there is no need for this. So as my colleagues said, uh, the main concern is integrity when there is integrity and uh, internal, uh, let's say, responsibility there is no need for certificate for every step we do. But that's also uh, um, supporting what uh, Dr. Jamil said, in the sense that it's the regulatory body that absorbs the cost of certification. But would it be correct to say that you have products which are halal and non-halal, but in the non-Muslim majority countries, they might not be halal, but in the Muslim majority countries, the same product is halal? Exactly. Yes. But does that not create confusion in the mind of the consumer? So when they're traveling, they're actually consuming a non-halal product. Uh, actually, there is a product which has the common sense that the, it is halal, it should be halal all over right. the world. But let's say, example, let's say uh, beyond when there is meat product. So it is not expected to have, uh, let's say, halal beyond in uh, Europe. While if they need halal, halal product is available. Nestle variety is available, but they have to look as a minority for this product and get it. But it is not for the general population. Jamie, um, certification is obviously a huge cost for Australia because the abattoirs have to have site visits from the importing countries. Uh, do you think that certificate or an international standard or international certification would be an easier way of doing this or at least a reciprocal arrangement between countries where they recognize each other's certification bodies? Yeah, from our perspective, as a supplier of halal red meat, um, any simplification would be a help. Um, we supply over 100 countries, um, and in every one of those countries, there are complexities, and it, it could be a McDonald's you know, burger chain or a, or a major supermarket audit, and, and many of these abattoirs are having two to three audits per week at certain times of the year and um, and that's what we understand that that's what we have to do because we want to sup be able to su supply their products so we uh, abide by their rules um, but any simplification um, is would be welcomed I believe I mean interestingly you mentioned that um, I'm also in the free trade agreement committees nationally and one of the things that now free trade agreements are doing is a reciprocal uh, uh, acceptance of halal certification and the most recent one that the GCC signed with Singapore is for the GCC to accept Singapore's certification. So there's no need to visit the abattoir. I mean, Singapore doesn't have abattoirs by such, but except for poultry ones. But there's no need to visit those abattoirs. Yeah. Uh, their local body certification is sufficient. Yeah, uh, probably Dr. Tony's um, a better man to talk to about uh, the Australian government halal program and, and so on. But... Uh, yeah, look, at, I, I see the, the global red meat production doesn't really change from year to year. No. 
it's, it, it's, it's like water and it'll go to the easiest path and, and that might be driven by, by, um, by commercial factors or it could be by closed markets as we've seen with Brazil into Saudi Arabia, et cetera, and the, and the product goes another way. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, all of our um, individual exporting businesses are still commercial operators and, and they make a commercial decision whether to supply a market. So, uh, based on, on, on that decision, um, you know, the, the strategically, obviously, they're in some markets and, and, and then you have your traditional um, markets, but uh, I think any simplification, any um, unification would be welcomed across the board. Dr. Hassan? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, as uh, Dr. Jamil mentioned about um, the, halal, the halal certification and certifying, uh, that it uh, will become a business, but it's in reality it's a business. Let's face it, it's, uh, it's something that um, some agency, they, they are more strict than others, and they, they mentioned that we are the best. And uh, as you know, there is also uh, some of the, of the obstacles we, we are facing uh, as a consumers and as an authority, I believe here, that should be unified regulation and also to have all this certification uh, uh, and the regulation should be, should be unified, like you mentioned. Um, for, uh, as an example for this uh, certification, in, in South Africa, one of the agencies there mentioned that, okay, in Saudi and UAE, uh, the chicken slaughtered here is not halal. And really it's surprising that you can see like there is some extreme from time to time. And, uh, and also when, when you, for example, want to certify a finished product on the line, etc., the certifying agency, they want also to have a certification for each raw materials, and sometimes they don't accept the certification coming from different agencies. And that, let's face it, it's, it's really a, a, a business, and the authority and the, the government should take an action about it and to simplify. As you know, for, for this kind of uh, uh, halal regulation, it's uh, as in, in Quran or in Hadith that Sometimes really we go in depth, which is impossible with the, the technology we are we have uh, we have uh, now from uh, from uh, from like I don't know 20 years, 30 years before until in the future we don't know what we will have as well. Maybe for this uh, food uh, security, it will be even worse. I believe. Tony. Thank you. Um, we got to know Australian halal. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll come backwards and I'll, I'll just restrict my comments to uh, how we certify halal meat from Australia because it's an Australian government supervised system. And, and firstly, we export uh, meat around the world to 100 countries and 70 of those countries uh, we're sending halal meat to. Uh, and in fact, we're using one agreed government certificate, uh, which is accepted as complying with the GCC standard has been accepted by all 70 countries. So, so from that point, of, from Australia's point of view, we've achieved one, one certificate, which is jointly signed by the approved Islamic body and the Australian government official. Coming back from that, uh, we have also agreed with industry and our Islamic bodies a single identification mark for halal, which is uh, placed on the meat uh, and it includes the establishment's production number to, to build into our traceability systems. So two of the key elements we're looking for in the debate, we have the identification mark and the certificate uh, already agreed, but as I said before, we're happy to work towards OIC standards uh, you know, in the future. But the biggest problem our industry is facing is, is the different accreditations needed for different countries. And even, even within uh, the GCC six countries, there's two separate uh, accreditations needed by cert certifying bodies. And in total, to export around the world, our Islamic bodies uh, could possibly seek six different uh, accreditations. So, so to me, this is, is where we're hoping that uh, the moves towards the OIC and SMIC having a single standard and a single accreditation is, is very beneficial. And, and I would agree uh, there's 
as you said, there's the, the uh, Quran has uh, set the standard 1,400 years ago. I think there's, there's uh, 95 or maybe even 98% agreement on what the minimum standard is. And I think uh, it may, as you say, being overthought uh, and it should come back to agreeing a simple documented standard. Uh, and as we said under WTA rules, it's simple to have agreement on single accreditation bodies. Uh, and then the, uh, the remaining 2%, I think we can deal with through consumer confidence, which we can do through <coughs> specific labelling of product. If some people want uh, certain stunned or unstunned or certain types of fish, uh, it is all in the same realms of uh, product integrity and labelling, such as uh, we do already for, for uh, organic foods, for example. I think there's, there's uh, a simple solution. Uh, we just have to get international agreement on the simple solution. Thank you. I want to take the discussion slightly to a slightly different angle. And the question I have is that halal production is only one half of the story. To have a truly halal production, we also need to have a more holistic approach. We need to have approach that includes halal logistics, Sharia compliant financing, and firms which actually follow the whole Sharia-based teaching? Um, or do you believe that is actually extending the concept of halal and we should only focus purely on certification? Yes. As uh, we mentioned just now that halal is all about integrity, uh, whereby the integrity needs to be preserved throughout the, uh, the supply chain. So this is where I think the, the concept of halal logistics, the concept of Islamic banking and finance you know, uh, comes in. Uh, because if we want to have a more holistic approach yeah, towards the development of the halal industry, then we need to have all these uh, you know, facilities to be in place. Uh, obviously, it's a challenge, yes. It's a major challenge in some countries. Uh, for example, uh, Islamic banking and finance, uh, you know, it's not been practiced by uh, some countries in the world, but okay, I mean, uh, you can't really have a very holistic approach. But I think uh, attempts uh, should be made uh, to have all these facilities in place, like uh, logistics, uh, Islamic banking, finance, and so on. Because, uh, like I said, at the end of the day, all these activities can be translated into economic uh, activities. From economic uh, perspective, if we can develop the halal industry in a more holistic approach, then obviously there will be business for halal logistics, there will be business for Islamic banking and finance. So what I've done, uh, even through my master plan that uh, I propose to the government of Malaysia, is to develop a halal ecosystem, as what we call it. So what we do here uh, in Malaysia is not only to focus on the production capabilities, we, we are also looking at the other enablers. Yeah, for example, the certification process, uh, the development of Islamic banking and finance, the, uh, the <coughs> establishment of halal logistics and so on. So what we're looking here is uh, the development of all these facilities towards supporting you know, the, the, industry, the, uh, the halal industry development, but also from the economic perspective. Because uh, what we do there is that uh, the government has uh, already recognised that halal is one of the new sources of economic growth for Malaysia. And uh, recently, uh, I'm happy to say that even uh, Prime Minister Abe in Japan has also announced that the halal industry is one of the key, uh, one of the four key industries that uh, will be the new industries towards the, uh, the new uh, economic development of Japan. So you can see that, uh, you know, not only Japan, we are seeing China, Korea and many other countries, they are already seeing halal from the economic perspective. How halal can be a source of economic contribution towards their country. So if you want to do that, then you can't be just looking at production capability. You must also look at the other industries that can be related towards supporting the halal industry. Then you can see a lot more economic activities can be created from there. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, your company does only halal production or does it have a more holistic approach in the Muslim majority countries? Uh, actually, uh we have a different uh, kind of production. But uh, here I want to encourage that we, we should have uh, a 
proactive approach. We, we shouldn't, uh, now the approach is to have more regulation on our border to make more restriction, more certification, etc. While uh, we need more a proactive approach that we go to the main player in uh, industry, uh, go to the main player in logistic and explain to them what is halal logistic, what is halal production, and uh, involve them in, in our concern and let them be part of this. Because uh, if we did not encourage the, the main player, we are, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, losing, losing certain big player and big suppliers which we don't want uh, to, to lose them. So we need to, to go to them, encourage, explain, and let them involve in our system. This is uh, my message. Jamie, I suppose your logistics would by definition be halal. Yeah, I think um, just on the just talking about the supply chain and the holistic view, um, Australia's actually uh, developed the world's first um, uh, meat quality grading system uh, called Meat Standards Australia. It's been uh, operating now for about eight years or ten years, and that's uh, it. Actually, falls in line with a lot of the um, uh, what's written in the Quran on around animal welfare. Um, you know, the animal, uh, the nutrition, um, and uh, and it's all, all actually ties into our traceability system. And our farmers, are, um, you know, the the whole process and every manage, management decision they make is is all about the quality of of the product. And that means, um, you know, our yet by yard designs, low stress handling for our um, sheep and cattle. Um, and it and actually it, it's that, it sort of that has a lot of parallels to the to the halal um, process. Something, Dr. Hassan. Concerning. Uh we go for in details about, uh, as, we, as you mentioned, there is halal production, there is uh, the halal uh, logistic uh, and Sharia compliance and the financial, financial system. In case of we want to involve uh, the industry to produce halal, pure halal products with all this uh, Sharia compliance, I think we will not have any halal food in the world. <laughs> no, really, because everything, uh, fin especially financially, in case of we, we uh, discuss about that, uh, you know, the benefits that in all banks, even uh, everywhere, it's really complicated. For that, I believe that we have to differentiate between the halal food itself and the financial halal. This is another... another uh, and logistics halal. Yeah, and lo logistics, it's also logistic if I... Uh, I don't know if it's the same for, for supply chain. I mean, this is the logistics that we can mention about how to move the product, raw materials, etc. not to have um, like uh, com complex, not comple complex, uh, yeah, complex supply chain, etc. Um, for that, I believe for, finan for financial uh, parts should be a separate uh, subject. And uh, concerning the logistics, this is... Uh, for sure that should be uh, involved with this food uh, production as well. Tony? Uh, yeah, I agree with Hassan's comments before about we mustn't overcomplicate things. And as we said before, with uh, food security, it, it's also food affordability. We can't add uh, additional costs onto uh, the food supply chain uh, and expect we'll be able to meet all the uh, food demands for the future. Uh, and in terms of logistics, uh, certainly from Australia, any product coming here is coming over this uh, sea air bridge uh, and uh, it is certified in Australia and for example a shipping container, I don't think we should over, overdo it. You know, we, uh, the logistics is quite simple, the uh, container is loaded under our integrity program and sealed and certified and that container then is not handled or you know, product is not handled again until it arrives at DP World. So it's already in the Muslim country and should be handled according to the all Muslim standards applying in, in the country of, of receival. So I think if we try and add extra layers on, we, you know, we'll get into adding things under IATA rules and, and whatever extra regulation will, will become an extra cost. And uh, uh, with, I think there's simpler ways to, to meet some of these logistic concerns uh, commercially without uh, trying to invent new standards. Right. I just have to ask a final question and then we'll have to end this very, very interesting session. And the question really is, 
how do you make halal from a niche market segment to mainstream? Because when it becomes mainstream, you have economies of scale, you have competitive advantage, costs fall down, costs fall, and it becomes a much more affordable product, and it increases the level of food security in the Muslim world. Should we start with? Yes, uh, firstly, I think uh, for the producers, they, I'm sure they, they will have to know about their markets, whether they want to go to uh, the premium markets or no, the, the basic commodities market like uh, certain countries in Asia or China and so on. Uh, obviously, whether it is a mainstream product or it is a niche product, uh, like I said, at the end of the day, the, the producers will have to decide uh, which category you know, their products will be and in which market their products will be relevant. Uh, secondly, uh, as I mentioned just now, halal should not be expensive. Yeah, obviously, uh, we have to find ways, you know, uh, whether the, 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 the additional cost is related to certification or is it related to logistic or whatever. So I think we need to address that. And uh, <clears throat> like I said, at the end of the day, it has to be made uh, affordable yeah, because already we are, we are facing a very severe uh, food insecurity problem. Where we do not need uh, additional costs you know, on top of that. So I think uh, there are two sides of the thing. Uh, firstly, the industry players are grappling with the standards and certification uh, issues. You know? uh, there are many, many logos. There are many, many standards that they have to follow. This is one uh, basic issue that we need to address. Secondly, on the consumer's perspective, uh, well, they would not even worry about uh, which logo or which certification that, that you go through because they don't even have the basic food on their table. So I don't suppose uh, they would have the time uh, to look at whether this is a Malaysian logo or, or, or a Indonesian logo or whatever because uh, the food supply is just not there. So I think uh, if we talk from the consumer's perspective, the situation has not reached a level whereby uh, they have an option to pick and choose. Yeah, which uh, certification or which logo they want to go to because the supply is just not there. You know, it's very limited. So I think uh, when we look at the halal industry and the food security uh, issue, obviously we have to look in a holistic approach. There are uh, different problems that are faced by the industry players. There are different problems faced by the consumers. So all these things we need to be uh, tackled separately. Thank you. Very briefly, it had, because I'm yeah. already getting signs and messages that I have to finish soon. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, uh, halal security food, uh, it's, it's in perception regarding Sharia is not 100% accurate. Because uh, the rule in religion said, Qaid al-Shari'iyya taqool al-darurat tubih al So in case we did not find halal food, uh, Muslims will eat non-halal. So, so it's now our, our duty as uh, industry, as regulator, as society to promote this uh, program in a balanced way, in a good approach that make it uh, successful. Otherwise, it will be uh, maybe, maybe fire back and, and it will roll down. Okay. Jamie, I suppose it's already mainstream in Australia. Yeah, I think um, from our uh, exporters in Australia, as I said, we supply over 100 countries in the world. Uh, we've done work last year, survey work around uh, technical barriers to trade. There was 180 identified of, as pri priorities. 130 of those were, were in the Middle East and North Africa. The, the, the number one concern was uh, shelf life, uh, where we can guarantee, we, we guarantee our product um, you know, for two years for frozen and uh, you know, 90 or 100 days for chilled products and yet we have um, uh, you know, 70 day expiries here, 28 days in Egypt, 49 in Egypt for, bone, uh, for, for boneless, you know, very short expiries that are actually affecting the cost of food. Sea freight is a very efficient way to freight and we supply it all through Russia, Asia. Um, the more sea freight we're doing, you're reducing the cost. If you can reduce the technical barriers to trade, then food will become more available at a better price. Thank you. Dr. Hassan? Okay. I Maybe I will mention uh, something that uh, when we have, we, we don't have to make the halal food as a competitive advantage. It's 
Unfortunately, we, we see from time to time there is like uh, companies, they, uh, they make uh, advertisement about their product, it's halal, etc. I, I remember one time uh, we heard about uh, a manufacturer of sugar. I mentioned the sugar factory is halal, etc. Really, we go in extreme, and for that we, we need to, to have to leave the, um, uh, the choice to the consumers to accept all food coming to the countries. And uh, in case of we declare halal, then the, the manufacturer has to prove that, has to have the certificate. Otherwise, we leave it uh, in the market, even in Muslim countries, and the consumer will, show it, will, uh, will have the choice about it. And in this case, I believe that for this security, uh, that we can, we can have uh, uh, the product available everywhere. Thank you. Yeah? Thank you. Very, very briefly, Tony. Yes, a uh, brief comment is I agree with your observation. In, in Australia, the uh, meat industry, uh, halal is not a niche product, it's a mainstream product, and this actually creates efficiencies in the production of the halal. The, the uh, meat companies producing halal are 100% committed uh, to do 100% halal product, uh, uh, and that saves them integrity costs in, in segregation and other systems in their plants. So they make the decision right at the start in designing their, their system, their food security and HACCP plan, uh, and they build the halal into the system to uh, cost of production and volume throughput to, to make uh, it an efficient operation. Thank you very much. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our panellists, Dr. Uh, Jamil Ihad, Jamie, Dr. Hassan, Dr. Tony. Thank you very, very much for a very interesting, very informative session. <laughs>